Most people consider the 90s to be the golden age of animated television because it introduced countless shows that were revolutionary for the time, many of which became cultural icons for the modern era. Think about where we'd be today without shows like The Simpsons, South Park, or SpongeBob SquarePants and the early Nicktoons. There's a reason why these shows are still relevant today and are used as examples for current creators to make our favorite tunes so awesome. They had amazing relatable characters, which is a huge part of effective storytelling. If we like the characters involved, then we'll invest in their stories. Pretty straightforward, right? That being said, it's no easy task for a kid's cartoon to engage a general audience, especially when it comes to the antagonist. Usually, a bad guy in a kid's cartoon is either a one-dimensional supervillain or a small-scale bully. However, the Golden Age of cartoons broke through these boundaries by saying, sure, it's easy to love the good guy, but we'll make you love the bad guy too. And that's why many of these shows are still ongoing, have reboots, or helped inspire the new original cartoons of today. These shows create a love-hate relationship between the viewer and the antagonist, which just so happens to be our topic of interest here at Channel Frederator. I'm JD, and today we're counting 10 cartoon characters you love to hate as a kid. Let's get started. Number 10. Team Rocket from Pokemon. Prepare for trouble and make it double, because Team Rocket is blasting off at the speed of light and landing right at our number 10 spot. Satoshi Tajiri introduced the world to Pokemon in 1996, and aside from Ash and our favorite little critters, there were some pretty quirky villains. So quirky and memorable that I bet you still know their motto. Surrender now or prepare to fight. Meow, that's right. Jesse, James, and Meowth aren't exactly masterminds when it comes to the life of crime. I mean, they say they're out for world domination, but their misadventures usually land them as the comic relief of the series. <laughs> At least it did in the first generation. While Team Rocket often seem like one-trick ponies, their characters eventually grew on you like a weird, unwanted fungus, which might explain why they're still mainstays on the show now that Ash and his gang are gone. Truth is, Pokemon just wouldn't be the same without Team Rocket. After all, the entire Rocket organization has evolved into a huge part of the Pokemon mythos, and trust me when I say there's a lot more that meets the eye when it comes to Jesse, James, and Meowth. For instance, we all know the Rocket duos are named after famous cowboy criminals, but did you know that the Japanese versions are named after warlords instead? Yep, and ironically, Meowth is based on the Japanese symbol of good luck. Another interesting tidbit is that James has a serious cross-dressing affinity that actually got an episode banned from US release. Oh, and Jesse is the dominant character because she's based on the head writer's abusive ex-girlfriend. I mean, these guys are quite the characters, and to make matters worse, they actually get married in the manga storyline. Number 9, Angelica Pickles from Rugrats. On August 11th, 1991, something amazing happened. The Nicktoon was born. Nickelodeon debuted three original Nicktoons, the second of which was none other than Rugrats by Klasky and Scoopo. Audiences were charmed by the day-to-day -day lives of a couple toddlers who viewed the ordinary world through their imaginations. But the realest character on the show was none other than the all-too-familiar antagonist, Angelica Pickles. The only three-year-old you've ever wanted to kick. Well, think about kicking anyway. Angelica's character was truly genius. True, the other babies were endearing enough, but because most of us dealt with bossy older relatives during childhood, this character was enough to make you cringe. She was the absolute pinnacle of princess, the worst of the worst, and she tortured the younger kids just for fun. Ooh, I'm having some serious playground PTSD right now. Still, as much as we hated Angelica, there were times that we really felt bad for her. After all, she was a complex individual with no one by her side but her doll Cynthia. Clearly, she was no one's hero. But for a three-year-old, Angelica could really hold her own. I mean, you have to be pretty smart to manipulate both kids and adults to be doing your bidding, right? By the time she turned 30, she could have achieved supervillain status. Number 8, Sarah from Ed, Ed, and Eddie. While the Nicktoons were making a splash, or splat, I should say, Cartoon Network created their own original series of shows under the infamous Cartoon Cartoons title that also dominated the 90s and early 2000s with shows like Ed, Ed, and Eddie. No one could deny that this show had its charm, because it was hard not to laugh at these three harebrained kids in their endless shady pursuits to buy candy, specifically Jawbreakers. Needless to say, somehow their plans always went awry, and typically it was their own doing. Of course, Ed's little sister Sarah usually made things worse. Sarah was so detrimental for such a young age. Her loud, aggressive mouth served as her signature on the show, and it was so terrifying that even the older boys would cower. Although, you can't help but smile at the fact that such a little girl could be such a big antagonist, even more so than the neighborhood bully Kevin. So yeah, Sarah annoyed the heck out of all of us with her relentless, nasty attitude. But can you really blame her? Just imagine if Ed was your big brother. Number 7, Dee Dee from Dexter's Laboratory. Dexter's Laboratory was the first cartoon cartoon released on Cartoon Network in 1996. It was created by Genndy Tartakovsky and pitched to Fred Renner's own Fred Seibert for his What a Cartoon showcase at Hanna-Barbera. That same year, three pilot episodes were chosen to air on Cartoon Network, the success of which landed Dexter's Lab a series of its own. The irony of it all was that Dexter's Lab wasn't inspired by Dexter, it was inspired by Dee Dee. The entire idea stemmed from a drawing of a tall, thin ballerina that Genndy decided to pair with a short, blocky counterpart for 
contrast, the character which eventually evolved into Dexter. The two were certainly an odd couple. Dexter fell into his respective role as the boy genius with a hidden lab, and Dee Dee evolved into the meddling older sister, a pain that some of us know all too well. Dee Dee made for a completely convincing character because her reckless behavior really made you want to shake your fist. In fact, the true beauty behind this character was her overwhelmingly girlish innocence towards every single situation, no matter how chaotic. It kind of made it hard to truly hate her because Dee Dee wasn't vindictive towards Dexter. She was just hyperactive and completely aloof in a very, very destructive way. Number six, Helga Pataki from Hey Arnold. Another quintessential slice of life cartoon was Hey Arnold, created by Craig Bartland in 1996. The show was loosely based on the friends and family in Craig's life and centered around a kind-hearted fourth grader living in the inner city with his grandparents. Now, I'm pretty sure the success was mostly attributed to the character development. They were all very authentic archetypes, even similar to my own group of friends at the time. Of course, the one that stood out the most by far was Helga G. Pataki. That was one tough broad that broke through all the stereotypes. You're right, Rhonda. I'm not like the rest of you. I'm not wearing a mask. The truth is, underneath that tough exterior was an insecure and talented young girl. And like most preteens out there, her feelings were often so complex that she didn't even understand them herself, which made her character possibly the most relatable on the show. Not to mention, her struggles were all too real. An unhealthy obsession, inattentive parents, a highly successful sister that constantly overshadows her. Honestly, I get why she was so angry, but I have no clue why Arnold had to suffer. Love is just a funny thing, I guess. Number five, Roger Klotz from Doug. Our number five spot goes to the first Nicktoon ever. That's right, Doug premiered alongside Rugrats and Ren and Stippy that fateful day and continued to have a four season run from 91 to 94 before Disney acquired the rights and revamped the show for their network. Doug was created by Jim Jenkins who based the entire plot and many of the characters off his own life. So that must mean that the real Roger Klotz is out there somewhere. The iconic bully loved to humiliate Doug since day one in Bluffington and for no real reason other than the sake of being a total D-bag. However, despite the crude behavior, we all love Roger because he's more of an obnoxious friend than a true foe. He wasn't a violent person, but more so a prankster that really loved to laugh at the expense of others. Ugh, and that laugh. <laughs> It was almost as haunting as Woody Woodpecker or Nelson Muntz from The Simpsons. Actually, Roger is a lot like the character of Nelson, in that his attitude was a product of his dysfunctional upbringing. Roger was raised by a quirky single mother with a low income. Well, trailer park. He managed to attract a group of followers, but Roger was a lone wolf by nature, a one-man wolf pack. While his morals were loose, Roger stood his ground when the time was right. And occasionally that meant standing up for Doug too, even if he made him pay for it later. Number four, Dip Membrane from Invader Zim. 2001 brought us a sci-fi cult classic of epic proportions, a show almost too weird for general audiences, but somehow landed itself on a kids network because it was just that awesome. Invader Zim stems from the twisted mind of veteran comic book artist Jonan Vasquez, the genius that graced the comic book world with Johnny the Homicidal Maniac and Squee the spin-off series. Any previous fan of Jonan's can definitely sense his stink all over the Nickelodeon cult classic, and that's just Zim speak for influence or artistic style. The show took a refreshing spin on things by making the alien, Zim, our main focus Focus, which made big-headed Dib the human antagonist. While it's not too often that we root against the human race, Dib somehow made it happen. He's just so annoyingly in your face and was persistent about it too. He became so obsessive in his pursuit to uncover Zim's diabolical schemes that you just couldn't help but laugh when his plans backfired. I mean, you know it's bad when an exiled alien is more likable in comparison. After three seasons of failure on Tim's behalf, it's really no wonder why Professor Memory referred to him as his poor insane son. Still, Dib was just one kid fighting for the world, and that's a pretty thankless job. He seemed like the only person on the entire planet with any common sense outside of his family, but they were far too self-involved to see that Zim was a friggin' alien, which, by the way, wasn't that hard to figure out. I mean, no ears, nose, and he has green skin. Come on, people. So sure, Dib was awkward and annoying, but he was the only person that cared enough to try and save our Mother Earth. Thanks to him, our world was always safe from the Urkin Empire, at least for another day or so. Number three, Bill Cipher from Gravity Falls. Gravity Falls premiered on the Disney Channel in June of 2012, and by the fifth episode, the tune had already attracted millions of viewers and an eager fan base. The quirky, offbeat series followed the paranormal adventures of twins Dipper and Mabel Pine, alongside their great uncle, or Grunkle Stan, in the fictitious backwoods town of 
you guessed it, Gravity Falls. Although the show was short-lived, it managed to produce a plethora of lovable recurring characters. Of those, a popular, rather interesting fan favorite was the isosceles monster, Bill Cipher. Bill is how you'd imagine the devil, but a lot more triangular. He's manipulative and cunning, always preying upon the desperate and looking to make a deal, but usually to his own benefit. Admittedly, he may not look like much of a threat, but he's capable of ripping your teeth out with just a flick of the wrist, and that sounds like one heck of a threat to me. As a master of the mind or brain demon, so to speak, Bill is charming and to a very dangerous degree. It's obvious he can't be trusted, but he's so convincing that people will still hear him out. Kind of like a really good car salesman. He's also got a wicked sense of style. That might not be the most important detail, but it's totally worth noting. Anyway, Bill never let us down as the main antagonist of Gravity Falls. We never knew what to expect from him, when he'd show up, or what he was secretly planning. It played into the whole mystery of the show and served as one of the main reasons we viewers kept coming back for more. Number two, Aku from Samurai Jack. Dexter's Lab wasn't Gendy Tartakovsky's only contribution to Cartoon Network. In August of 2001, the animated phenomenon known as Samurai Jack hit the screen with massive positive reception, and the revival series premiered on Adult Swim in March of this year. As anyone who's seen the show will tell you, it's legendary for several reasons, and arguably one of the biggest reasons is a coup. You know, the master of masters, the deliverer of darkness, the shogun of sorrows, there's more, but you get the point. Aku is the ultimate in tyrannical villains, but he's more than that, he's pure evil that you can't stop watching. We're talking about an ancient, shape-shifting, flaming-eyed demon whose screams can open wormholes in space and time. He's pillaged lands, he's enslaved people, and oh god, did I mention the crucified dogs? Pure evil! But oddly enough, his pure evil makes the show so good. Watching Jack face off against Aku always seems hopeless. Like watching Hulk Hogan fight the actual Hulk. You know it's gonna be bad, but you just can't look away. So, I guess we have to thank Aku. Come here, you evil monster, you. And number one, the Joker from Batman the Animated Series. That's right, number one on our list was the all-time favorite, the Joker from 1992's Batman the Animated Series. And do we really need to explain ourselves here? The Joker is one of the most memorable, iconic, timeless, and beloved psychopaths in all pop culture. In fact, he's somehow more relevant now than when he first debuted on screen all the way back in 1966. The critically acclaimed animated series did justice to the franchise, as well as to the nefarious villain, and Mark Hamill ranks among the top portrayals of the Joker to date, often right behind Heath Ledger's notorious anarchist Joker from The Dark Knight. In fact, he still reprises the role occasionally. As an ode to the original animated series, Mark Hamill returned to the Batman Arkham video game series developed by Rocksteady alongside his co-stars Kevin Conroy and Arlene Sorkin. But why do we love the Joker so much? Well, for starters, he's been Batman's deadliest nemesis since the first comic book released in 1940, and that's not something that should be taken lightly considering there's a ton of villains in Gotham City. Still, none could hold a candle to the clown prince of crime, who finds joy in tormenting his victims psychologically before torturing them physically. Not to mention, as the master of manipulation, the Joker's mind games could make anyone go insane. And Harley Quinn is a prime example. As much as she's devoted her life to the Joker, she's always just another pawn in his evil plan to take over the city. The Joker is diabolical to say the very least. Why do you think his schemes almost always involve innocent bystanders? Otherwise, where's the fun? He definitely provides games for us to watch and solve, deadly as they may be. Good thing he's not real though. There you have it guys, I'm JD and thanks for watching 10 cartoon characters you love to hate as a kid. Who's your favorite? Did we miss any characters? Comment below and let us know. Don't forget to click the bell icon to become part of the notification squad. We have videos dropping every week, so make sure to subscribe to Channel Frederator, your cartoon central on the internet.